Hello, good day and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we're going to continue talking about JWT. So this is part two. Now, if you haven't seen the previous video, um, here's a link to that video. You can find it in the description below and here on the screen. So assuming that you're all up to speed, you can remember we ended with what a JWT looks like. So that's where we're going to continue. So let's jump in. Our previous video ended with a sample JWT, which was this very same JWT that is on the screen right now. And as we can see, there are three distinct parts to this one very long string. And the parts are delimited by a period or a dot. So I'm gonna say period or dot interchangeably. And there's that first part in red, then the middle part in what looked like, you know, purple, and then the last part in blue. And we don't know exactly what that information is because it can you cannot easily read it. And the reason why is because this these parts are base 64 encoded. Okay. Now, if you don't know what base 64 encoding and decoding is, um, let me just tell you really quickly. It's a way of taking data that might be binary or have special characteristics based and so on, and removing those. Um, the binary data converting it to um, text which uses A through Z, uppercase and lowercase, the number 0 through 9, and just a few special characters like dot, maybe equal, but not things like dollar sign and slashes and certainly not space. And so why might you want to do this? Because the medium you might want to send it or the way in which you want to send it, in plain text, it otherwise wouldn't work if you were to send binary data. And so base 64 encoding um, remove those type of characters and encode it in a very special way. You don't need to know how it's encoded. All you just need to know is that something is basically for encoded or if you have something you like to send and you're worried about how it might be interpreted um, because either it's binary or something, you can base 64 encode it and then just have a string. And we'll, we'll see how to decode this, like I say, and how to encode things. So let's go back a little bit and talk about how do we get a JWT. Let's say we're trying to log in to a set of service. So let's say we want to log into service one, which in turn will call service two and then it's called service three. What we would like to do is to be able to pass on some information about ourselves to those three services so they know that, oh, hey, is Vero trying to use the system, my user role or my different roles, so um, it can off, you know, allow me to do the right thing. So or what am I authorized to do? And of course, it wants to know if I've already talked to the authentication service, like the security service. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the client or me need to log in or authenticate, authenticate with the security service. And I must provide my username and password. Notice that JWT is not used for authentication, right? What it's used for is to pass around information about someone who's authenticated. So in this case, I must provide my username and password or whatever other mechanism there is for, you know, authentication to establishing trust, right? To say who is who and what they are allowed to do. I still need to do that part of it. And then that security service now returns a JWT with enough information that I can then pass around we're going to see that the stuff that's in a JWT is not encrypted, right? This information about the fact that this is Vero that's logging in, how long is he going to be logged in for, his roles and user ID and all that stuff. That stuff is not encrypted. That's important. This is stuff that can be sent plain text. Because if you remember, I said the parts of the JWT is base64 encoded. It's not encrypted. It's encoded. All right. So then once I get my JWT back from the authentication service, now I can send that to the different services or they can send it to each other. Remember I said that uh, when you log in, there's some information that you know you wanna pass on to these different services so they can know like who they're dealing with. So here's an example. So a user want to interact with a service S. And so in the JWT, we might want to pass the user ID, their name, the roles that they have, when this token was issued, you know, like created, um, and the email, maybe the service that they're trying to use, need to use that to look up. Like if the users can have kind of service to say, give me all my comments or all of my topics, need to know that username or user ID. Or maybe it needs to send an email on your behalf. So it needs to have your email address to know where it's coming from, 
or maybe it's want to have your username to be able to put it in that email, right? So for all these reasons, depending on what the service is doing, it needs this information. So where would this information come from? Well, again, we said this is going to be the JWT, and this will come from the authentication service, the, author, the security service authentication service that have all this information. So when I presented my credentials to the authentication service, it can then present a, to me a JWT with all this information. So now that we know that our users need to exchange certain information with a service that they're using, and these are the type of information, and it's plain and it's open, there's nothing here that could be secret. You don't want to put in your JWT anything that's secret. So don't put a password, don't put a PIN code or anything that's supposed to be secret. You want to just use information that can be seen by anyone. Now we're going to talk very soon about how does a service know that the user hasn't tampered with this information, right? Because you can imagine the user contact the security service in step one that we had before, get back to JWT, and then since I said it's plain text, just simply decode it, UU64 decode it, add some, give themselves a new role, UU encode that, and then try to pass that on and say, oh, I basically I'm an admin, just because they added that to the roles. So how does the service know at all the user would have tampered with it? And we'll get to that. So let's go back to our sample JWT and try to understand it better. I have the JWT token structure. The token in there is overused. Um, it's repetitive because JWT just means JSON web token. So this is really JSON web token token. So um, I didn't catch that at the time when I was um, when I made the slides, but oh well. But we talk about these three parts, and I said that the first part there in red, um, that's one part, and that part is the header. The next part, that middle part in purple, that's the payload or the data that you really want to send. So this is going to contain all that information, for example, that I showed before, user ID, the roles, the username, all that sort of stuff. That's the information you want to pass between service. So that's going to be the payload. And then the last part, the part in blue, that's the signature. And this is important. This is how the receiving service, the service or the thing that received the JWT can verify that this information wasn't tampered with. So even though everything that's in the red, the header and the payload is completely transparent, you can just decode it because it's UU um, base 64 encoded, guess what? The signature is going to be computed over those two pieces of data, the header and the payload. And if the signature doesn't match what's inside of the header and the payload, then that service note was tampered with. Now you might be thinking, why can the users just recompute, change the information in the payload, recompute a new signature? Then it will match. Well, true. But then when they send that signature that they've computed to the service, well, the key that's used to create the signature would be different, right? Because they're not the issuing service. They're not the security service. Now, if you are not sure about when I say a key, what does that mean? Well, you need to go look at my video and here's a link to the first video in a set of video in which I talk about how you compute, you do digital security. So now we know that how a digital signature is computed over the header and payload. Then we know that how the service, because of the key it's going to use to try and decrypt the information, if it wasn't the same key that was used to encrypt it, it's going to get garbage. And so the service that's trying to decrypt this is going to have the same key that was used to sign it, which means our security service. And so if a user tried to create a new signature, they shouldn't have the key of the security service because at that point then security is pointless. So here I am in my co-editor and I have copied and pasted the JWT we had as our sample. So I'm gonna copy the header. And remember the header is this first bit, so I copy that. And I'm gonna go to this website that have a base 64 decoder. And they have many other encoders and decoder, but the one I care about is the base64 decoder. You can certainly play with a base64 encoder just so you understand it. Paste some string with spaces and stuff and see what you get. But here I'm gonna paste in our header for the JWT because this is already base64 encoded, so I want to decode it. And as you can see, it's just a JSON value that has algorithm as a field and some value and then type that says JWT. So let me copy this and keep it. And so I'll go back and in my editor, I'm going to make a note saying basically this JSON document was from our header. So this is the encoded value. And then of course we have the decoded value. Now let's do the same thing with the body or that payload, right? I'll just copy all of it. I'm going to go back 
to the website where I can just paste it in this box and have it decoded. And now you can see this is yet another JSON document. So let's copy this and paste it into my editor and do a little bit of annotation here. So I'll say this is the payload. And of course, it's the encoded value that's encoded in base 64 and then the decoded value, which is that JSON document. So I'm just kind of making some notes basically um, to show you. Now, if we look at this JSON document, um, we can see it says SUB, which means subject and there's some ID. Now, this is similar to like ID. If you look at my sample document between line 16 through 24, you see on line 17, I have a um, field called ID. Now, that can easily be called subject. And we'll get back to why some of these names might be different than you think. Essentially, JWT suggests a few um, field names that you can use. So subject is one of them. Um, we saw IAT, which I'm using there on line 22, which is issued at, um, and there are some other ones. But generally, this is just a, um, a JSON document. So you can essentially put anything you want. Um, and then I have, there's a field called name, um, there's a field called roles. Again, we're back looking at line 10, sorry. And then there's an issue at also field in that. So that's the JSON document that we decoded from our sample JWT in that it had in the payload um, a four fields or four pieces of data about the user who this token was issued for. So now we know how to decode this information. Here's the question, should we use it? Now the header just tells us that all um, this algorithm, ALG, you know, if we look at line six, is HS256. So that was the algorithm that was used to sign this JWT, but we haven't gotten there yet. And the type of this information that we're gonna look at is a JWT. But the thing is, should we assume that this user who sent us this information, whether directly or indirectly, is indeed an admin? Do they have the role admin to be able to access maybe some information or part of the site or some data that other users don't have? That's the question. And so if you say yes, then I'll say that oh, you don't have enough information yet because we haven't validated that this information, the, the header and the body wasn't tampered with. We don't know that oh, the type field wasn't tampered with on line six. We don't know that algorithm field on line six wasn't tampered with. And we don't know if anything on line 10 wasn't tampered with. We have to look at the last part of our JWT, the signature. Essentially what we have to do using the key the secret key, we're going to compute our own signature over the header and payload. And if that resultant value that we get is the exact same as the value that is attached to the JWT as the signature, then we know it wasn't tampered with. Because we've computed the same exact thing that was given to us using the key that only us and the server should know, which means that the user didn't tamper with it because if they had tampered with it and created their own signature, they wouldn't have had the key that the server and I know, the shared key. So that's how that's how what we need to do before we use this information. So this video is already a bit long and so I'll end it here and I'll show you in the next video how we compute the signature. So before I get out of here, I want to thank you for watching the video. Please thumbs up, like, leave comment. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you very much. And in terms of supporting the channel, I really appreciate it if you or somebody you know is going to buy any Tesla product to use my Tesla referral link. We both get some points, so that would be awesome. Of course, there are other ways to support the channel too, if you can. All right, take care. See you. Bye.